We have been in a series of messages that have called the big picture understanding revelation. And in this last book of the Bible, Jesus unveils for us different visions to John regarding things that must soon take place, including several scenes depicting the great cosmic battle between God and Satan. Satan, who constantly wages war against the people of God. And what we read in Revelation is that the time between the two comings of Christ, his birth and, and his ascension back to heaven and his second coming, this time we live in today, will be marked by Satan's angry pursuit of God's children. His aim is to destroy and kill off all things of God, including the children of God. And so if you strive to keep God's commandments and maintain your testimony for Jesus, you, by that fact, are a target for Satan and for his destructive efforts. We read these words in Revelation chapter 6. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God, and for being faithful in their testimony. And they were told to rest a little longer until the full number of their brothers and sisters, their fellow servants of Jesus, who were to be martyred, had joined them. This has been the case throughout the history of the church. Over 2,000 years, there have been countless numbers of those who follow Jesus being martyred, being put to death for their following. In Revelation chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 12, which we looked at last week, both present visions to us. The, the big picture of Satan relentlessly attempting to destroy the church and the advance of the gospel. And chapter 12 is a summary of the war between the lamb that was slain and the dragon. And it reveals to us why we have issues we face on earth today. It speaks of what Satan has done and what he is doing and will continue to do in this world that we live in. Revelation 12 tells us that Satan knows his time is short. He knows, as we learned last week, that he has been defeated in the past. We have the power to defeat him today, and he will be ultimately and forever defeated in the future. So he is out to do maximum damage to Christ and his church and to Christianity. Satan is the unseen cause of evil and opposition to the work of God's people that is happening around the world today. Wherever God's people are working to advance the gospel, wherever God's people are working to be a light in the darkness, you can absolutely be sure that Satan, in a realm that we don't perceive with our eyes and our minds, is working and influencing and moving in a way to disrupt the advance of the gospel. This has been happening more and more in countries where foreign governments are not favorable to Christianity. Because of the internet, there are become so many different ways to transfer money to foreign countries. And what foreign countries who are, who are resistant and opposed to Christianity are doing is they are, they are really clamping down on foreign mission organizations like Mission Few, like the Mission in Haiti, from transferring money into their country that will be used for the advancement of the gospel. It's become a deeply complicated process. And we can explain it and we can say, well, there are hostile attitudes in these countries' governments regarding foreign funds being used to advance Christianity in their country. And that is the human flesh and blood explanation why we are having so many difficulties, including the organization I'm involved in, Mission Fuel, 
We've been running into barrier after barrier recently about trying to get funds to our partners in India. But we know the explanation for why this is happening goes much deeper than the flesh and blood government of these countries that are opposed to Christianity. For we know that we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. That is what we are fighting. And that is why we're having trouble getting money to these countries. Revelation chapter 12, where we began last week looking at Satan and his work. I want to pick up with verse 13. Revelation 12, beginning of verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. And then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And so these verses and others in Revelation teach us that Christ followers, people who live in the in-between time of the two comings of Jesus, and of course that includes you and me, we're going to need wisdom. We're going to need patient endurance. We're going to need perseverance. See, we are called to be faithful to God even when we are called upon to face trials and tribulations because of our faith. And we know that many of Jesus' followers in history and around the world today face horrendous persecution. Many Christians we know suffer and even die for the sake of their faith in the advancement of the kingdom of God. So what is it that we can learn from these visions in Revelation? What's the big picture for us to see of this spiritual war between God and Satan? What is it that we need to understand? Well, the very first thing we need to understand is that criticism, antagonism, and persecution from the world is expected. We ought to expect resistance. We ought to expect criticism, antagonism, and persecution. Because there is a spiritual war that is raging in the background of history. It is raging in our world today. Revelation makes it clear that Christians are going to be attacked by the dragon, by Satan. It's going to happen. It is happening. It has happened. And he will target those, and I love this definition of a Christian. There's no better one. Those who obey God's commands and maintain their testimony about Jesus. Is that you? Does that describe you? As someone who seeks to obey God's commands and maintain your testimony about Jesus. Because if that describes you, you need to clearly understand you are in the crosshairs of Satan. Now, he's going to attack in very different ways. In countries like India and Eritrea, Afghanistan, China, he's going to make it very, very difficult for us to be able to get funds to the nationals there so they can fund the work of advancing the gospel. He's going to work through government officials to disrupt that. Here, he may work to devour you in a very different way. He might do it through, through temptations. He might do it through, through your own personal suffering. He might do it in many different ways. But we have to know that he is trying and he is active. And Jesus himself warned that if they persecuted him, they're going to persecute us who testify about him. He said in John chapter 15, remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you 
also. And so it is, a, it, is, it is a fact that Satan is waging war on Christians. And he has been doing that since Jesus' death. He's not stopped, nor will he stop. He knows that he's been defeated in the past. He knows he is defeated in the present. And he knows he will be defeated in the future. But that does not stop him. He is on a vengeful mission to undermine God and the advancement of the gospel and simply to exalt himself. And from the moment the church was born in Jerusalem in AD 33, Christians have been persecuted for their faith. First, at the hands of the Jews whose religion Christianity arose from. And then from the Romans who controlled many of the lands across which early Christianity spread. And ever since then, Christians have been the target of persecution, sometimes even to the point of death. Today, it is estimated that 100 million Christians face persecution around our world. A mission organization called Global Missions reports that more than 160,000 Christians around the world lost their life because of their faith in 2019. Countless others are subjected to unimaginable horrors, according to this report. We're also witnessing today fast-growing hostilities toward Christianity in America. Supreme Court Justice Amy Conan Barrett was criticized by Nancy Pelosi for her strong faith in God. A host of the TV show The View said that former Vice President Mike Pence was showing signs of mental illness because he said that Jesus, the Son of God, leads and guides him. When presidential economic advisor Larry Kudlow said that the future of his life was in God's hands, commentators on MSNBC and CNN said this made him unworthy of being appointed to public service. Another media commentator on these issues said people like Pence and Kudlow should keep their religious views private. And these are just a few examples from the recent news of media ridicule and criticism of people in public life who express their Christian beliefs. One of my favorite football players, and he should be one of your favorites too, is Russell Wilson, the quarterback of the Seattle Seahawks, because he is just an amazing, outstanding Christian man. He is not ashamed of his faith, and he will regularly post Bible verses and, and, and Christian thoughts on his Twitter account. And it is just heartbreaking to see the vile, vicious comments people make when he posts something like, love thy neighbor, or Jesus is Lord. It is just mind-boggling the response that he gets. He has lost television advertising opportunities because he is bold for Jesus. When he announced he was engaged and became engaged to his girlfriend, he was asked and somehow, and I'm not 100% sure how it got, but he shared that him and his girlfriend had made the decision that they would abstain until they were married. He was mocked all over social media for that, ridiculed for that decision. And this is what goes on when Satan gets the minds of people. There was an article in Newsweek in January of 2018 that examined the plight of Christians in a dozen different countries around the world. Newsweek, which is not a conservative magazine by any means, they still recognize that the persecution and the genocide of Christians around the world is worse today than what they say at any time in history. And they note that Western governments are failing to stop it. And this article noted that the treatment of Christians has worsened substantially in the two years prior to this article being written and has grown more violent than at any other period of time in modern history. And the report said, and I quote, not only are Christians more persecuted than any other faith group, but ever-increasing numbers are experiencing the very worst forms of persecution. So in the last 30 years, we have moved from a Christian era to a post-Christian era, and now into an anti-Christian era. 
Some of you are experiencing more and more resistance from family members or from friends or coworkers because of your strong beliefs in Christ. Persecution and harassment of Christians has quickly intensified in this new millennium. And as God's children, we need to be prepared to handle the tough times of opposition. Because the Bible tells us as we get closer and closer to the second coming of Jesus, we will witness a greater rejection of God, a greater rejection of God's word, and an increasing embracement of Satan's lies and deceptions. And and folks, what we are witnessing in our world today is a rewriting of what is sin and what is not sin. A redefinition of what is right and wrong. An adamant stand against God's word and truth. But it's all signs signs that Jesus told us about. Isaiah chapter 5, it says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Folks, if this doesn't describe life in the 21st century here in our country, I don't know what does, because that's exactly what's happening. Evil behavior of all kinds is no longer evil, but they are now respectable personal choices. We accept in stride the common immorality of our times. We no longer blush, and we're no longer shocked by the immorality that goes on around us. I mean, people used to blush. No one blushes today. Sin is embraced. Sin is celebrated. Just take a peek sometime at the, at the world of, of Hollywood, the world of top athletes, the world of influencers, the world of rap stars and rock stars. People are proud of their sin. And our world is getting to look more and more like an end times world. Wouldn't you agree with me? And Satan is behind all of this. In the same way as he influences and is behind government officials in places like India and Eritrea and and Iran to disrupt the advance of the gospel. He's disrupting the advance of the gospel here in a totally different way through media and through influencers and through A-listers. But he's behind all of this in his sordid effort to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. But Jesus told us that the gates of hell will never prevail against the church. We're going to face criticism. We're going to face antagonism, even persecution for talking about Jesus in this world. But we need to do it anyway. And as we get ever closer to the second coming of Jesus, we're going to witness an increasing level of severe persecution and tribulation for all who follow Jesus, for all who speak of him. It is, and it will be, a trying time to be a Christian. And if you're bold for your faith, and if you let your light shine, if you're not hiding it under you know, a a, a furniture behind a bushel or whatever, you're going to experience it. It's going to happen, and you need to expect it. So how how can we, in our world, 21st century Titusville, Florida, how can you and I expect to be persecuted today? What, What are some of the things that we face in the world that we live in? Well, I want to just give you a couple of few things, and and you probably know this because you experience it. And, and, And the first thing I think is ridicule. And this might be on the lowest level of what we would call persecution or opposition, but ridicule. If you are a Christian and you stand for your faith, there are going to be people who are going to ridicule you for your beliefs. They're going to make light of your moral standards as they did with Russell Wilson. They're going to make nasty comments about your stand that goes contrary to the political correctness of their values. So you're going to hear accusations like you're judgmental and you're insensitive. You're hypocritical or you're self-righteous or even ignorant to believe that kind of stuff. But of course, Jesus said, blessed are you when men ridicule you. 
And so we're going to deal with ridicule. We've got to be willing to face that. We're going to deal with some alienation. There are going to be people in this world who feel very, very uncomfortable around Christians who don't participate in their same activities. So you may find that you don't get invited to some gatherings because people are just uncomfortable having Christians in their midst. And they're going to be very conscious of doing what they like to do. And they may just exclude you. You may not be welcome anymore in certain circles. Another level is harassment. This is a more deliberate form of persecution, harassment. This is coming like today. Government authorities here in the United States, they're cracking down on religious exercise with gusto. Zoning officials have clamped down on home Bible studies. He even tried to limit the activity of, of some churches, especially over the past year. And I'm certainly glad that I live in a state where we've been allowed to continue to worship and not been present, prevented from gathering as we do. And so we're going to deal with ridicule. We're going to deal with alienation. We're going to deal with harassment. We're also going to deal with the suppression of Christian views. The suppression of Christian views. Listen, if you believe and you promote the biblical view of marriage and sexuality, you're labeled a homophobic and a hater. If you own a business, you just might get canceled. If you defend creationism and point out the flaws of the evolutionary theory, you're going to be called ignorant and unscientific. If you talk about the leadership order that God has established for the home and for his church, you're called a misogynist. And please do not suggest that Jesus is the only way to heaven because then you're not being inclusive. And so we're going to deal with the suppression of Christian values and views. And then maybe the more extreme form of, of persecution, of course, is arrest, physical beatings and death. We don't experience that here in the USA yet, but I'll bet that day's coming. But many of our brothers and sisters in Christ face these extreme types of persecution on a regular basis in our world today. And so you can expect to be persecuted. And it may just be in the form of some ridicule and alienation, but it's increasingly becoming in our country harassment and suppression. And the logical next step will be arrest and physical beatings and death. So what should our reaction be when we're opposed? What should we be doing? How does Jesus want us to react to what we face in today's world? Whether it's ridicule or <clears throat> any of the other forms of persecution. Well, I want to give you some do's and don'ts that I think constitute appropriate responses to persecution. And I want to, before I do that, give credit to a pastor named Bob Russell for these suggestions. I read them on a blog this week while I was researching this message, and I thought they were excellent and said, I'm not even going to try to improve them, although I added one to the bottom of the list. And so these are five things, and then one from me, that, that I think will help you, I pray, to know how to respond and react to any type of persecution. And number one is don't be surprised, do anticipate it. Don't be surprised, but do anticipate opposition. Peter told us, friends, do not be surprised at this painful trial you're suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. Listen, if you're not experiencing any level of harassment, any level of alienation or ridicule because of your faith, you've probably got your light under a bushel. You probably are dimming out and not shining real bright. Because the normal thing that happens to a Christian who is shining brightly, who is unashamed of the gospel, who speaks on behalf of God, is to be ridiculed, alienated, harassed, suppressed, arrested, beaten, put to death. That's the way it goes. And friends, don't be surprised at it. In fact, you ought to be alarmed if it's not happening to you in some form or some manner. Paul said in 2 Timothy, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 
So if you're not feeling any ridicule, if you're not dealing with any alienation or harassment, I'm telling you what, you need to look at your life and make sure your light's shining bright enough. If you're not hitting your life, you're hitting your light somewhere, it's not shining. Somewhere along the line, if you are living your life unashamed of the gospel to which you have given your life to, there's going to be somebody who's going to oppose your faith, so don't be surprised. Number two, don't be paranoid, be objective. Don't be paranoid. Now, don't interpret every slight, you know, as, well, that's persecution because I'm a Christian. Maybe there's someone who treats you poorly, but they treat everybody poorly. They're nice to, or they're not nice to Christians and non-Christians alike. So don't view every incident that happens in your life, you know, as someone is persecuting you. I mean, there are some Christians, I think, <clears throat> they really, really want to feel as if they're persecuted. They want to identify with Christians who face real persecution. And so sometimes we'll create environments, we, we, we'll maybe be overbearing, be obnoxious, be arrogant, and maybe we are guilty of the accusation somebody makes. I mean, maybe, listen, Paul told Titus, he said, make the gospel attractive to those who are not believers. And I, I think a lot of Christians live very unattractive lives. And, and, and non-believers look at Christians and say, I don't want to be like that because of the way often we present ourselves. And so we've got to be objective. Maybe the criticism we're receiving is valid. Maybe we should be listened. Maybe not every time we're criticized, it's persecution. I remember a couple of years after I became a Christian, I was 16 years old when I became a Christian. I was zealous and I was out to convert the entire world, including, you know, my parents and my brother and sister. And I, I was really zealous and, and I was at it all the time. And, and I remember a year, year and a half into uh, my decision to be baptized and be a Christian. And I remember my mom saying to me, listen, I don't want to hear any more about this new religion of yours in this house. She's tired of it. And I could have said, oh, oh, I'm being persecuted. I'm being harassed for my faith. But the truth is, I was a zealous, overbearing, annoying pain. I was. I deserved to be called out for it. And my mom accepted Christ, and I had the privilege of baptizing. She asked me to baptize her a few years later. But I'll tell you, it wasn't because of me. Some very mature ladies in our church ministered to her with grace and undid the damage that I probably caused. And my mom became a Christian, I say often, not because of me, but more likely despite me. And so be objective about the reactions you receive. Number three, don't complain, do rejoice. Don't complain, do rejoice. Jesus said, blessed are you when people insult you and they falsely say all kind of evil against you, rejoice and be glad. And I know that is so difficult when you're wounded. You've been ridiculed, you've been alienated, you've been harassed. Our nature is to, is to strike back. Our nature is to maybe complain and let people know how, how tough it is being a Christian. But the Lord says you rejoice and you be glad if you're persecuted for righteous sake. And so don't complain, do rejoice. Number four, don't cower, become bolder. Don't cower, become bolder. You know, in Acts chapter four, the Sanhedrin, they threatened Peter and John to not speak anymore about Jesus Christ or there would be serious repercussions. And then in Acts, we read that the early church, after this order from, from the Sanhedrin came down, they met and they prayed. And in verse 29, Luke tells us how they prayed. They said, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak with great boldness. Now, they didn't say, Lord, consider their threats and bind them. Lord, consider their threats and give them leprosy so they can't do this. Lord, consider their threats and protect us from all harm. They said, Lord, consider their threats and give us great boldness boldness. And then verse 31, it says, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. I mean, their pray prayers for boldness were so intense that the place began to shake, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God boldly. 
And the next chapter says day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news about Jesus Christ. And so don't cower in the face of persecution, ridicule, alienation, harassment. Be bold. Our first responsibility is to obey God, not man. And if we're ordered to keep silent about any of God's truth, we just got to be more bold. And we got to be willing to accept the consequences of this world, whatever they may be. We're not to cower. We're not to be ashamed of the gospel. We're to stand boldly and courageously for the truth, regardless of the consequences. Number five, don't retaliate. Show love to the persecutor. Don't retaliate. Show love. Jesus said, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. And then he said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, folks, those are really, really hard verses to live out. Probably the most difficult thing I feel like in my Christian life is to want to bless people who curse at me or criticize me, to love my enemies. That, that's really, really hard. But you know, Jesus didn't talk about it. He actually did it. He was tortured. He was ridiculed. He was harassed. He was arrested. He was beaten. And then he was executed. But as he was dying... He prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And so Jesus didn't retaliate. He just showed love. And the number six, and this one is mine, the one I added, do not be afraid. Trust God to protect you. Don't be afraid. Do trust God to protect you. I want you to see something in Revelation 12, which, you know, we've spent the last couple of weeks in now. In this chapter, the dragon attacks three different beings. The woman, the child about to be born, and the rest of the offspring of the woman. Now, in the first vision, the dragon is ready to devour this pregnant woman's child the moment it was born. But we read that he was snatched up to God and to his throne. And so that baby, of course, is Jesus. And you know, it wasn't right away, but Jesus suffered, he died, he was buried, he rose again, and he ascended back to the right hand of the Father. And so John is given a vision, and John could say, yes, that's Jesus. I see that, how that happened. That's that's Jesus. Well, after the dragon, Satan, failed in his pursuit of the child who was born, the devil next pursues the woman who gave birth to the child. But we read this, the woman fled into the wilderness to a place that was prepared for her by God where she would be taken care of. That wasn't good enough for Satan. He tries to drown this woman and he spews a river of water in this vision. He opens its mouth and a river comes flowing out of it. But Revelation 12 says, but the earth helped the woman by swallowing up the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And and, and so the the, the dragon goes after the child. The child is snatched up and taken to heaven. The dragon next go after the woman, but the woman is led to a place that God prepared for her to protect her. And then Satan attacks again and spews this river, and the earth swallows up the river. See, here is the big picture. I, I don't, I'm not going to try to figure out how all of that fits in today's current events. That's not my purpose. But here is the big picture. God's church will be preserved and will be protected. That's the big picture. Now, that doesn't mean that no Christian is ever going to be harmed or put to death for their faith. We've seen that is a part of what we should expect. But the church as a whole... Not you, the church as a whole. See, you and I, we're the tiny little microscopic picture. Your life is just microscopic and tiny. But the big picture of God's people is God's people will never be destroyed. The gates of hell shall never prevail against the church. God will protect his church. So the dragon, he was defeated in in, in trying to devour the child. He was unable to devour and destroy the woman. So what does he do next? 
Well, in these visions, he now wages war against the rest of the woman's offspring. And guess who that includes? Like you and me and the people sitting around you and our brothers and sisters in India, China, North Korea, Eritrea, Sudan. That includes you and me. And, and I want you to see what Revelation 12 says about the offspring of the woman, you and me. They triumphed. Or we could just stop there. They triumphed. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. They triumphed. Satan could not destroy the child born, which represents Christ. He could not destroy the woman who gave birth to the child, and she represents the early church. And he has been unable to destroy the rest of her offspring, which is the church down through the ages and includes you and me. Listen, folks, Satan hates you. He hates everything about your love for God. He hates your commitment to obeying God's command. He hates that you maintain your testimony for Jesus. He hates everything about the church. He hates everything about the people of God. We have been engaged in a war with Satan for 2,000 years. And you know, it's a staggering testimony to his wickedness. He knows, as it says in verse 12, that his time is short, yet he continues to assault and accuse and do everything in his power to undermine the advance of the gospel and the faith that you and I have in Jesus. He is certainly a roaring lion looking to who he can devour. But here's the deal. We've been guaranteed victory. Not because of our righteousness, not because of our spirituality, but because of the victory secured for us by the blood of the Lamb who cleanses us from all sins. And so here's the deal. Even if we were to die for our faith, like many, many, many millions have over the course of 2,000 years, even when a believer is put to death by flesh and blood forces in this world, Satan loses because we don't die. We don't die. We just, we just change addresses. We get to go home where we ultimately belong. See, this world it is not our home. We are to feel like aliens and strangers and foreigners in this world. And just like the woman in Revelation 12, she flew away to the place prepared by God for her. One day, we're going to fly away to the place that God has prepared for us, a mansion in heaven. Listen, Jesus does not promise a life of constant ease, but he does promise a life of joy. He doesn't promise a life that's going to be free from opposition or suffering, but he does promise that in the end, there will be eternal life. Satan is defeated. He's going to try to take down and stop things as much as he can, but the gates of hell shall not prevail. A couple of nights ago, my wife and I, we watched a movie uh, called Greater. Uh, I had posted something about the movie on my Facebook page. It was a wonderful, wonderful movie. It's on Netflix called Greater. It's a true story of a young man who grew up in Arkansas, and he had this dream and this, this, this hope. His life hope was to play football for the University of Arkansas. There was only, only a, a few problems. Number one, he was really overweight. Number two, he was not a naturally gifted athlete. And number three, his mom had no money to pay for him to go to college. But he was determined. Again, this is a true story. He was determined. And so the story is, is about him growing up and his determination to play football at, at the University of Arkansas as a Razorback. But he was also a Christian very dedicated young man. And when he got to college, he was ridiculed for being fat. He was ridiculed for being not athletic. He was ridiculed for his faith. But over the course of his four years at the University of Arkansas, 
people began to change because his light just shined so brightly. People began to, to just get touched, and, and, and he led a bunch, of his, a bunch of his football playing friends to Jesus during his four years at the University of Arkansas. Now, I'm not going to give you any spoil alerts because it's a true story, and as I said last week, we know how true stories end. It ended in tragedy. This young man, uh, Braden Bulwark, he was killed in a car accident just a few weeks after he uh, graduated from the University of Arkansas and before he was to play, uh, and he had been drafted by the Indianapolis Colts. And he was killed in a horrific tra- car accident. And the movie begins with scenes of his funeral, and then it backtracks to his life and begins to tell us how, how this all came to happen. And then the movie, of course, ends with the funeral. And the song that you know so well, I'll Fly Away, is an integral part of this movie. See, Brandon's daddy would sing this song to him. His dad had a real problem with alcohol. And they had a, a very difficult relationship. But his daddy would love to just get his guitar and play I'll Fly Away. And Brandon learned this song growing up from his dad. And he was baptized. And, and it just became a, a part of his life. And at the very end of the movie... When, when they're having his funeral and, and people are just tore up, they're sad, they're brokenhearted, they're just a mess. But then the people on stage and the pastor begins to sing, some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. And you just begin to see smiles coming across these grieving people's hearts. And you know, whatever we're going to face in this earth, whatever is before us, We have the promise that one day, just like that woman in Revelation 12, we're going to fly away. That is our hope for whatever you have to face. And so Thursday, about 5 o'clock, which is about 30 seconds before the worship team gathers here to practice for today's service, I called Tyka and I said, don't you love when I call you a minute before worship rehearsal? And she goes, what now? And I said, is there a chance we can pull the song you had for after the sermon? I want to do I'll Fly Away. And it was confirmed because I knew I had had the sermon written, but it's fine. But I had not seen the movie yet. And then the next night, Susie and I watched the movie, and there's I'll Fly Away all over this movie. And I just knew that this was the way God wanted us to end this song. Because this has kind of been a, in a little bit of a downer message. You know, I mean, we're going to be, we're going to be persecuted. We're going we're gonna to be opposed. It happens. And, and we, we get it. But I don't want you to leave feeling all down. I want you to leave with a smile on your face. So let's do what they did at the end of the movie. Let's stand. And our worship team is going to lead us and I'll fly away.